Welcome everyone to a new gameplay series on Field of Glory Empires. This is a grand strategy title that is focused on ancient Rome and ancient uh, Greece. We'll see it's uh, allowing you to play a lot of different nations in this time period. So it's kind of got this paradox type feel. In fact, I would say that a lot of people would put this as a competitor with the recent paradox release, Imperator Rome. Um, it's made by Ajod, developed and published by Slytherin. Uh, I would say if you wanted to get the best idea of how the gameplay plays out, it's kind of actually similar to a Total War title, I would say even Rome Total War, but with a lot more detail for history, for the individual nation flavor. Essentially what, the way I think about Age Odd titles is they're a little more niche, but they also have a lot of history knowledge smashed into it. And I would even say that this, especially compared to Imperator to Rome, is a little bit more railroaded with a historical feel or has it has more of a historical progression. That's not to say that you can't paint the map entirely your color. That's the goal and that's what we'll end up trying to do. Um, but it, it just feels like nations on their own if you just let things develop. Develop uh, more in a historical way and maybe I would even say develop however they are developing it feels more historically accurate that it's done that way. Just the mechanics at work feel a little bit more realistic. Um, I'm not to say, that's not to say that it's necessarily more entertaining. Uh, sometimes arcade type games are a lot of fun and I'm not trying to say that Imperial to Rome is arcade. -y. Let's not um, get too astray of the point. You can see that the, this is the game map. This is the, the limit of the game all the way over to India. You can play as the Maria. I mean, this was one consideration I had for one of the nations I play as. Um, it would be pretty interesting to try to paint the whole map of your color starting from the very east moving all the way to the west. I don't think it's uh, possible, or maybe it is possible. I mean, I'm sure anything is possible, right? But uh, So the different nations, they have a very different way of playing. If you try to play Rome the same way as Ptolemy, exactly what I did for my first two nations, I found Ptolemy was a lot more difficult. Um, just It's not, but it's because I was playing it the same way as Rome. Well, it turns out... You really should kind of investigate the modifiers for every different uh, empire or nation or whatever that you can choose. Since, like I said, Ajod has really built in this different play style for the different nations. And I, I would say that this is partially, I'm not sure if this is their desire or just an end result. It shoehorns them into a bit more of a historical style of play. Okay, so for this series, I'm going to play as Pontus. I really thought over, there's so many good options. I'd like to play as the smaller nations and expand in those tribal zones. I'd like to play as Rome, but I feel like that one's probably been beaten to death. I even tried to play as Ptolemy, but this one unfortunately is so big that it starts off with a lot of micromanagement. You have to micromanage, you know, so many different provinces. Um, actually, these are regions and the big circles are, I mean, there are a whole bunch of regions make up a province. At least that's the jargon or terminology I'll be using. So Pontus, let's read the story about her. She's Hellenic. Um, Pontus established itself as an independent kingdom in 302 BCE. It survived defeat by Antigonus and managed to drive off a Seleucid invasion in 280 BCE. After this, it slowly expanded in Asia Minor and had fluctuating relationships with its neighbors. Called upon by the kingdom of Bosporus up here <clears throat> to help against the steppe nomads, Pontus absorbed it entirely. Originally allied with Rome, it even sent a small force to help in the Third Punic War. That's against the, the um, Carthaginians, of course. But the emergence of Mithridates VI changed this. Yeah, this is a big historical figure. He started by, by making gains at the expense of Armenia, uh, and was able to expand into Bith Bithynia as Rome was absorbed in civil war. So Bithynia is here, yeah. Uh, in Civil War, that's the LA, uh, LA War, the War of the Allies, where Rome was at war with, I guess, the other city-states in the south that were nominally allied with her at the time, but wanted more citizenship rights and stuff like that. Anyway, um, he started to make, although we read that, uh, a major revolt in Spain, which um, we know that the famous general who's now, we know, but I suddenly can't remember, is it, <laughs> what's the heck is his name? Ptolemy. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. Yeah, the famous general <laughs> in around 60 
oh, 89, whatever, um, went to put out, and then he came back and put out the rebellion in Southern, the slave rebellion. Anyway, this led to further wars and a complete Roman victory by 64 BCE. After this, the southern half of the kingdom was absorbed into the Roman province of Bithynia and Pontus, but client kings retained some independence to the north of the Black Sea to 62 CE. Let's take a look at the gameplay. These are actually really, I think, very well done, the gameplay advice. There's only a few things I would say that there's a few typos, not typos, but like west is exchanged for east, some, like, some things like that. Just look for those and use your common sense. Anyway, your main challenges are powerful neighbors and an empty treasury. However, Pontus is interesting as you have so many opportunities to expand and you can emerge as a main power in the Black Sea region. Your best chance may come if either the Antigonids or the Seleucids start to collapse. You have the Alines Soter modifier that will favor conquest of the Hellenistic regions, but will penalize you once you expand in other foreign regions. Equally at the start, you will soon gain access to pirates, and these can be very valuable at looting and earning you much needed income. So I've played P Pontus um, for two streams, about two hours each, four hours total of time. We'll get into the modifiers as we load into the game. Uh, and I feel like it is a really good balance of starting small so that early game management is pretty simple and it kind of showcases the game mechanics at a very easy to grasp level. So what I like about it is essentially that we can start playing this and ending turns quickly and you can still learn how to end a turn efficiently how to do a turn efficiently that's my goal is basically to hopefully get us to a point where or you the viewer if you're interested in learning how to play this game better i hope that by watching me i'm not an expert full disclaimer I like full disclosure or big disclaimer i'm not an expert at this game there's a lot of things i need to learn still and hopefully through the comments i will learn a little bit more from you guys but in the meantime, I understand how to play the game at maybe a better, at least an intermediate level. And this is probably more than most people I've seen play on YouTube. So it's really nice to actually see how to play the game uh, well. So a lot of people don't seem to understand the decadence and progress system, which I'll cover probably at some point, maybe not immediately. We'll talk about these things as we go along. Uh, another thing you can do is there was a podcast, Single Mall Strategy, um, that I'm a part of. And we did an episode on uh, Field of Glory Empires. A lot of the stuff I talked about there, uh, probably I'll just be rehashing here, maybe with slightly better information since I'm a, a little more knowledgeable now. So we only start with two regions. We are not at war with anyone. The Antigonids are not really friendly towards us. So if I go to Diplomacy, you can see that they're wary, which is probably somewhere worse than distant, which is probably going to be what our relationship with most people is. It's just distant. Um, so wary is obviously not a good thing. What that means is we're going to have to kind of watch our borders with her. She's probably not going to want to... Oh, she actually has a 10% cooperation chance. I might just throw that out there. But no, actually I won't because... <laughs> if she... As this thing... As the the way this usually goes is the... Um, one of the modifiers for the uh, Antigonids is they have to be at war with a lot of people in order to satisfy in order to not decay as a, a nation in order not to age which I'll, I'll get into later obviously but um but it's a bad thing obviously so that ends up meaning that they fall apart pretty quickly <laughs> we'll see like historically they did and we'll see the decline of their empire probably pretty quickly what that means is all i want to do in the meantime is try to take over calibia because the province i have here is Three, uh, three regions, and the region of Calibia is still independent. So it's Hellenic independent. Unfortunately, it's actually <laughs> Caucasian ethnicity, which means if I take it over, we will have to face some decadence against it, but it's fine. The other thing we want to do is also take over uh, Anatolia, which is completely Hellenic. And that's just something we want to do before the Antigonids take it over. Um, if we can, it would also be... I don't know if it's beneficial or not, but it might be interesting to take over um, Lyris as well. Uh, one interesting thing I'd like to see is the trade details. She has no... So there's honey here, which is amazing. So let's just probably immediately try to take over uh, Anatolia, which is a hill, which means the width of it is eight. We only have exactly eight in this army. We'll 
we might end up losing some people. Well, the population is four, so they probably only have like four, um, what is it called? Urban A militia, urban militia, basically. Militia urban A, I don't know. I guess the order in Latin is completely irrelevant. The <laughs> order doesn't mean anything in Latin. But that's not the way it works for most people's brains because we're all brought up in languages where ordering does matter. So uh, unfortunately, I guess it differs between the typical romantic languages and English. English would be uh, urban militia and probably in a lot of the romantic languages, it would be militia urban. <laughs> anyway, wow, lots of silly asides, but let's just get into the game and decide. I guess I have to decide. I'm gonna buy myself a little time by looking at our building choices. So your typical term processing is figure out what you wanna do with your military, figure out what you wanna do for construction. And the last thing I do is citizen management. This is very min-maxi. You may not want to bother uh, rearranging all where the individual citizens are. This is just like in civilization. You're allowed to control which ones go to science and industry and stuff like that, or food. Or you can pick the ex exact hexes which are work. This is the same mechanic, but in, or if you're familiar, this is an even better analogy, but probably people are less familiar with this, with the Endless series. Endless Legend, Endless Space. They have the four different tiers, science, industry, money and well, it's basically the same thing here culture for us is the is a big one because we want to be progressing we do not want to uh you know lose too much uh, growth of our empire to decadence so progress tokens are bad and i guess i just in inevitably have to cover this so let's just at least do some lip service to it right away um your uh culture value is important so culture basically allows you to progress decadence pulls you back. Uh, decadence is determined by stuff, by like numbers, algorithm. The algorithm is not exactly clear to me. However, what I know is the larger size you are, so the more people and the more provinces is more decadence. We can also see the individual decadence here. So accumulate decadence is 0.3. We'll accumulate 0.3 every turn, as it says, as is in the second line. Um, but 10% of that is dropped at the end of every turn as well. So that means you'll just slowly accrue decadence, but in theory, as you build up your nation, you should be also increasing your cultural culture. So hopefully we'll just slowly in time be um, gaining, because the ratio is what's really important. It doesn't matter one or the other, it's only the ratio which determines your position. Now our position is 14th, but I, I guess this is just, doesn't matter at all until the end of our first turn, which is the first chance. The What matters is your position, can I look at the position? I guess I can in the ledger somewhere, but... Okay, here it is. So we're 14th right now with a <clears throat> potential ratio of three. Um, this won't matter until it's recalculated at the end of the first turn, but you wanna be in the top 25 spots. Um, that gives you a 30 or 35% chance to get a progress token. Five progress tokens and your empire uh, moves up to the next tier. So right now, glorious, uh, we're stable. We're a stable monarchy. If we get um, five progress tokens, we'll move to be a glorious monarchy. Some people, uh, so if you're in the middle, you don't get any progress or um, aging tokens. And the people in the bottom third, which is 52 on, have a 30, 35, whatever percent chance of getting an aging token. Um, five aging tokens and your empire, nation, whatever, uh, regresses or ages which usually, you know, I mean, not just usually, almost always is a bad thing. <laughs> so at that point, <clears throat> if you get another set of five, I think you either have civil war or sometimes for like clans, you can just disband. So that's a lot of gameplay mechanic talk. I know that we're still in turn one and it's 15 minutes in. I wanna try to make this a, a series which is available or like accessible to many people, not just people who wanna learn all the hardcore details. So let's get into the construction of our two provinces. Preceptor House is really an amazing pick. The only downside is it does cost two infrastructure. Um, so that's the upkeep you pay. It's not, um, upkeep is almost never in money. It's always in infrastructure, which is, you know, you can kind of abstract it as you're paying people to go around fixing things. Now that is, if they're fixing those things, they're not building new things. And that's the mechanic. So right now we have plus seven infrastructure here. 
Actually, because we're in a, a province, you can form provinces, which is a good thing. And that means that the construction for um, the infrastructure growth for my two regions is actually shared. Uh, I think in general, it's a good thing to do that. I, I just imagine it is. There's also province uh, military units, provincial, some kind of provincial military unit, which is usually some kind of nice military unit to have. So um, a really good choice for us. Actually, we have several several really good choices right off the bat. We have public works, very few. So there's also slots. You can see we have two out of four. This is usually just your population. For Rome, it's population plus one because they have some special modifier. But for us, it's always gonna be just the count of our population. We have population four, so our building slots are out of four. Um, some works, some buildings though, don't use a slot. So you are slot limited, which kind of, it's a nice balancing mechanic that a small place can't build a lot of things. Um, so there's two good options right now. We have this public works, which gives us more infrastructure. That'll help us to build things faster. Or we can do an anchorage, which gives us money for nothing essentially. It's free, it doesn't have any upkeep. It gives us siege resistance as well. Um, it allows us to, this boarding cost means that we can, uh, land units can transfer to the water. Uh, for, cost of four is pretty expensive, which probably means that they spend their whole turn just going from one land province to the next ocean province. Um, with less boarding cost, they might actually be able to keep moving or you know, uh, unload from a ship and keep marching. Anyway, the other one that is a really good choice here is this preceptor for two reasons. One, the decadence reduction, which is minus 0.4. That's more than we even gain right now. Or uh, also getting the the culture. Now, it does need papyrus, which we can currently get from Apamia. And if I'm not mistaken, Apamia is right here. So it's pretty far away, which I think the distance away impacts the amount of money it costs to import it. Essentially, it's a good option for us eventually. I do want extra culture, which is going to get us into the progressing tier. But for now, this anchorage is just so good. It gives us a free tier one. Uh, um, so another mechanic is you you need three tier ones or three of any type of building. They're different. They're color coded. Right? Green is food. Yellow is like economic. Uh, red is infrastructure related. Blue is health related. And red is military and purple is culture. Uh, so if you have three of one type of building, you, ha you have access to the tier twos of that same category. So we have one, we have this pirate slayer, which is a great one, by the way. And now we can put anchorage in there. It'll be a, um, just a, a zero slot. So we'll, we'll still have two building slots available. It'll give us a little bit of money as well. And it'll count as our second of the three needed before we can start getting tier two building options in the economic category. All right, this is a lot of explanation. I feel like <laughs> just kind of blowing through these things here. What do we want to build over here? Uh, public works is always a good option because it just gives you infrastructure, which we need. Oh, I really like orchard though. Oh my goodness, I really like. So this gives us, um, every now and then, various buildings will give you a bonus if you have a very, like some trade good or some, of some kind. If I go to the trade goods, let's close this for now. In uh, Polemia, which is our capital, we have a, a trade good of iron, which is great. Uh, that's a very good one. You can see the trade value is six, trade income is seven. We also have over here nuts and seeds, which trade value is four, but um, this is actually really nice because it provides, it will provide, we can just share between our two states, our two regions, um, this trade good, which means that orchard, instead of you know, um, only giving us five food, will actually give us 10. Now I'm mistaken here, I'm not gonna choose orchard after all, because I thought orchard provides wine, but that's a vineyard or some other thing. Is it vineyard? Yeah, maybe it's uh, farm. I, I, want, I, I, I want this uh, something which provides not just food, but a trade good itself. So I'm not gonna do that one after all. We can see I could build if I wanted another um, Pirate Slayer, but we have one, we don't really need another. Preceptor House probably makes more sense here in the capital, because generally I will end up crewing a lot more yeah, uh, decadent increasing things in the capital. <clears throat> I think that we might even have one already. 
Uh, no, just the loyalty penalty. It's a little bit weird. I wonder why it unlocks, <clears throat> uh, gives us a loyalty penalty. <clears throat> so sorry. Um, so what are we going to do? Let's do public works then. There's also an option that if you don't like any of these, obviously these are the other, well not obviously, but the other available structures, if you didn't know, are listed here, which means that I got Orchard, this is like a random card draw, essentially. And you can reset those and get a different set of card draws for each slot by choosing the shuffle option. That's three years, every turn is a year, so that's three turns that we don't want to spend. Public works, zero slot usage, it's just, it's perfect for us. So we'll choose that one. <clears throat> now the last thing, as I said, first we do military, second, I mean, did we, did we didn't even do military. I want to take Farnesia. I'm not sure where the Antigonid army is, I guess I'm just going to go ahead and risk. <laughs> We're going to lay our cards on the line here and go ahead and go in. Um, I hope that this is enough to defeat their urban militia. It will cross the river. That's also bad. Uh, <clears throat> oh, we need a general as well. What's our general? Oh my god, he's terrible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold off one turn. We're going to get this one instead. And I'm going to use one turn that I have to build as many of these as I can, which is one. And I guess I'll get one of them. One of these is, oh, I can't build that either. So we only have enough to build one Pontic Archers. These are very good, they're my provincial unit. They're pretty expensive, unfortunately, but I think it'll be worth it to get one extra unit and a better general. We'll wait one turn, get those all together, and then we'll, we'll go in and we'll see if we can take this territory. Uh, if the Antigonids don't take it. <laughs> very next turn okay so we have our buildings the last thing we want to do is manage our population growth and whatnot so um, one thing to note is that if you grab from the anywhere but the rightmost you're actually grabbing all the ones from there to the right so if I just click this one it's gonna tell me I'll if I move it here I'll get plus six here but I'll get minus six minus five from infrastructure this is food infrastructure money and culture the tabs here align with the fort so if i want to get more culture which i mean i do probably i'm not sure if i can do this right away but if we do this you can see that the public works time drops because i'm moving from infrastructure over to culture culture went up from 12 to 18. um <clears throat> the if i grabbed so that's what one will, will do but if i grab two it now shows i mean that's if you click on the left it grabs both of them in general slaves are better at uh, slaves are only useful at the top two. I mean, they can basically do almost like nothing. I think, let's see. So they're five here or two here. So they're just, they're twice as effective in the top two. We'll keep them there. But I might actually try to, I don't want to go negative in food and I do want infrastructure still. So we'll probably put one back over here. We'll take a, a hit on money for now just to try to push out these things a little bit faster. I want to focus on infrastructure. I want to focus on food to get more population eventually. But I also want culture so that we progress. So yeah, here's the, the big challenge, right? The big balancing act. Um, I think we will put this one here. And so here's the, again the, the challenge that I want to only move this one. So I have to move the other two somewhere else for a moment. And it's exactly five and five i think we're, we're at plus nine food i'm gonna be okay putting all these guys in infrastructure because i want the our buildings to start going quickly so that is how we end our first turn twenty five minutes into the video my gosh well it's gonna go faster as we get going that was a lot of explaining hopefully i won't have to explain any of those things again and uh... we can really push through. I'd like to get through, uh, like it would be great if I could do like 10 turns a, uh, a video or so. I plan to keep these around around the 40 minute mark uh, for the length of the videos. So the Antigonids somehow have, or we'll probably started with three progress tokens. And you can see the various nations picked up aging tokens if they were in the bottom tier. We're in the middle. We're actually pretty close to the bottom tier, so we'll have to be a little bit careful about that. Thank God we did a little bit of extra <laughs> investment into culture. And the best thing, of course, is if we're at the, the top tier, it, that would be the best. Uh, then we'd be getting progress tokens rather than aging tokens. And five of those, as I said, leads you to 
the next level of your government. Okay, so let's take a look at what happened. We have Anchorage in one turn, which is fantastic, and eight more turns for public works. Good. So I think that even just doing the exact same thing, it, like n changing nothing here, is going to be an okay solution. Um, as, as we're slowly going to... I imagine other nations are going to start to decay in their culture or increase in their decadence. People going to war, fighting, taking over new territory, all these things. Basically, if you're not inward focused, you're probably going to be decreasing in your CDR ratio. I, I guess it's called CDR, right? Uh, culture to decadence ratio, so CDR. <laughs> so your CDR generally goes down if you're not if you're doing anything interesting, if you're not inwardly focused. We're kind of inwardly focused. Okay, I guess not. We'll probably drop if we take this, but we shouldn't drop that much because of this special trait that we have. Uh, modifier, this Alina is Soder, which means that um, if I read the second sentence, a conquered region with a majority of Helenes won't have a temporary production penalty nor any decadence from conquest, contrary to the usual. So this um, one, the one we're targeting is Hellenic completely. Only only the Hellen people here. So, or we can just call them Greeks, right? Uh, so it's going in there should not give me a significant increase in decadence. We'll see if that's actually true or not. I don't, I don't actually know how much that modifier impacts things. Okay, and as I said, we don't really need to change anything here. Food is good. It's going to take forever for this one to grow, but that's only because we're probably overemphasizing over -emphasizing culture and stuff like that right now. And a, kind of a good thing, I mean, this is a weird way of saying it, but it's almost a good thing if we lose... Um, it's a good thing. It's a win-win because if we lose infantry, if we lose part of our army, it's less upkeep we have to pay. <laughs> and if we don't lose, then we win, and hey, that means we have a new territory, which is great. Okay, so that's... I don't need enough talk. I always like to double-check things but not much more to say. I think we'll just end the turn. Give me a chance to take another drink. Let's see what happens. Hopefully the Antigonids don't attack here at the same time. Hmm. Okay. So our first taste of combat. We're at nine units, they're at eight. That's gonna give us an advantage because we will... F oh no, hills are actually eight wide, so we won't flank, but we will have one support unit where they... D and they won't. One thing to note, I mentioned, I hope I mentioned, you can export the tactical battles to Field of Glory 2. As I said, this is very similar, or I think I said, this is very similar to the Total War series, series of games. Um, it's basically, this is kind of like a total, this is kind of like Rome Total War, but where the strategic map is the focus instead of the tactical. In fact, the tactical is only available, as it says here, if you have Field of Glory 2. So, but then you can actually export this to Field of Glory 2 and play the tactical battle out and then you can import the results of that battle back into this game. Very cool. Um, we will not be doing that, so let me actually view the battle. And I guess for the very first time, I'll just walk through this pretty quickly. A lot of you are already familiar with this game, so I'm sorry. Uh, I won't. The combat kind of speaks for itself. We're going to get these two things. First, range combat. Anybody with range is going to launch, and it may deter the enemy's effectiveness. In fact, for us, it only deterred their effectiveness, which means they're in even worse state. Then it's going to be head-to-head -head fight, and in this case, um, we have a plus three support bonus because of our Pontic Archers, which is amazing. So that means that this is not as good as I thought. Our combat rating of three versus theirs three, they get a plus one for terrain defense because it, we're fighting into the hills, so they, every one of their units will get this plus one terrain bonus. Uh, however, we have a plus three support bonus because um, we have a, put the Pontic, Pontic Archers behind. We're also going to be rolling two dice instead of one. So, unless we get very unlucky, obviously, well, we should win, but I was going to say, I, my luck is not always the best. Okay! <laughs> Speaking of bad luck, it's just, this is just, just silly. <laughs> Perfect example of Tortuga luck right there. So we lost our first battle. I hope that that's not how this continues because, we, I mean, it'd be very bad. Even being disadvantaged by one, we should come out ahead because we're rolling two dice. Oh my god, what the frickin' heck. The Tortuga luck strikes again. Alright, we both roll 10. It's the only way we could have done any damage to them. <laughs> uh, that we didn't do a lot of damage, that's because they're a skirmishing unit, and it takes you have to win by a significant amount in order to actually do damage to skirmishers. Essentially abstracting away the, their ability to just run. 
Okay, this is... Okay, we finally got a bonus there, and that was very important, because we lost two. And the important thing is, the winner of the battle, if there is a winner, will, um, will pursue the enemy. And that pursuit is where um, you can actually eliminate a lot of their forces. Now, pursuit is not important for us. If we win, this is a, an independent nation, so they just immediately surrender to us. So pursuit is not important. The important thing is that they don't pursue us, which would eliminate a lot of our forces. Okay, we got a victory there, albeit a small one. Really need these wins. Okay, that's a, that's a huge one for us. We got That's our luck back. Um, we need to win this as well. We did. Okay, so I think that we will end up winning this battle, which means that we will take the province. And that helps us. So here's the pursuit, not pursuit, it is. Okay, so it's a victory for us. Fantastic. And the next time I'll do continuous play, you kind of understand how it works. This pursuit phase did not matter. The only thing which really mattered is that we lost one unit. And that's the end of the battle. So we lost this one unit. That is as something which happens on the strategic map. This doesn't matter because basically this nation ceases to exist. So it doesn't matter what um, people we killed or didn't kill. But very good. We got um, added to our province count, or not province count. I always like to call these little things provinces, but they're like regions, or I don't know what we want to... Oh, and not only that, but we actually progressed. We got a progress token and moved it, so that was a very good turn for us. We lost one unit. That's one less maintenance we have to pay. And uh, on top of that, we captured a territory, and on top of that, we moved into the next tier, and on top of that, we got a progress token. So, which I, I suppose we'll see the percent chance for that to happen in a moment. Oh, yeah. Wow. 24 to 3. This is... 8 CR ratio will put us definitely towards the top. So, the chance is 35% that you get a progress token. Basically, 1 in 3. And we did. So, fantastic. Now, we're not at war with the Antigonids right now. We don't want to go to war with them. I would... Did they decline our... Did I... Offer them? So, we defeated them there... In the reign of Vitos, I don't even see what my ruler is. He's savage. Infrastructure penalty 10%. Well, uh, you know, this is kind of normal. I would say that uh, the, as the Tortuga luck usually goes, it's probably... I've had like a, a bad ruler, not even a neutral ruler. Or a bad ruler. But I've had s like straight up a bad ruler probably in 70% of my starts. Probably about two-thirds. Um, in fact, what I did on the stream was I kept re-rolling until I got... I mean, I gave myself three restarts, or two restarts, the first one and two others as uh, choices for my ruler, but I got a good one on the second one, I think. Anyway, this is not terrible. This is definitely manageable. Infrastructure penalty, I mean, let's be honest, it really hurts in the beginning of the game when you, <laughs> you need those buildings so badly, but we'll make do. So an anchorage was complete, and hey, we got a good start since we took this. Um, let's take a look at what we've actually got here. So you can see there's almost no decadence, which is fantastic because of this um, whatever Soter, what is it called again? Alina's Soter. It's really helped us out. Uh, now this is not in the same province, so although we can view the province here, this is acting on its own, which means its infrastructure only goes to itself. Now they're trying to build a shepherd house. I need to see if we already have a shepherd house. Do we already have one? No, so that's actually a fantastic thing for them to get. It's ready in one turn. We're not going to mess with that. Uh, they're actually doing six culture as well. It's pretty cool. Uh, what if we move you here? It's going to take infinite time. It's going to take one turn. Perfect. So let's just have the one citizen work and these guys start getting more food. Uh, we actually have no buildings in this place at all. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Uh, we probably won't um, do anything with this army. We'll just leave it. It's still the eight original that we had. I mean, it's not the exact same eight. We lost one regular infantry. We replaced it with a Pontic Archer. I would actually call that an overall win. Um, the Pontic Archers are not as good at fighting in the front lines, obviously, but they're a better unit if you reach, like, a, a full army size. So, and then we did finish construction of the Anchorage here. And, oh, Quarry. So, the Quarry has this really sad negative effect that it removes five health but there's a huge benefit in that it provides stone and stone is a really nice um oh wow the theater is also really nice 
Rather costly for a low tier building, it's, it is still of great interest from a culture standpoint. Well, we're already in the progressing tier, which is... I'm a little surprised that we got there that quickly. Ooh, Crafter District uses zero and provides some money. Also provides Commerce Bonus. That's a really nice one as well. We only have two buildings left. We do have to take that into consideration. Oh man, the Herbalist is another great one. It gives you health and manpower. Uh, pop usually health is more, more important for the higher populations. And that's not to say that something can't happen to a smaller population, but that's actually the game's own recommendation is that you emphasize health type buildings um, the bigger you are. So we'll probably shelve that for now, even though it would be, it only take three turns to get. It's only 30 infrastructure, so. Mm. I don't know, this is such a nice one. It only costs two infrastructure, and because we're a province, we can share that burden. I don't think I'll get a stud. The minus five health. I mean, the, another thing to, to take into consideration here is the infrastructure costs 100. It's going to take us 12 turns to get this quarry. But it does produce stone, which we... Ah, man, there's a lot of things which can use stone. So one of the, um, let me just take a look at my trade details here. We need dates, or the things that we're missing or importing or missing a bonus from. Those are kind of nice things to consider. Sales, figs, and dates here. So honestly, not a whole lot of interesting things. We have honey from here and nothing else is going on. There's no buildings. We're importing wool and hemp and we would get a bonus from stone. Marble, oh, marble is really hard to get come by. Uh, ceramics and luxury. So maybe this is a good idea to do then because the stone will be put to good use. It also gives us infrastructure, which is pretty valuable. The opportunity cost here is that we won't be able to do anything for a very long time because it'll take a lot of our time. Uh, many years to build and this crafter district is a zero slot usage which provides commerce bonus it's quite a good choice so you can see the uh, decisions in this game they're so well balanced that they really make you think i think i'm gonna go with the quarry hopefully that crafter district appears i okay actually i am gonna go with the crafter district i changed my mind and the reason why is we have two tier ones so now we can actually start seeing tier twos after this, so I'm gonna go with that instead. Um, I'd like, you know, I would actually prefer if we could. Um, yeah, you're gonna take so long to grow, but I need that infrastructure. And you, I might actually, nah. Yeah, it's gonna take a long time. Five. Probably leave this just as it is. If I take one of these guys minus five away, this will be the population will be starving. So this food thing is very necessary. Okay, so let's end the turn here, and then I'll probably save the save the game and um, wrap it up, wrap up this first episode because we're getting near the forty minute mark, which is about where I want to leave these episodes. We don't have any decisions yet. Well, that means it's one less thing I have to worry about. But we'll cover those. I'm sure we'll get some very soon. There's usually a lot of decisions that you can go through. Another thing I should be considering is building enough in an army to take Calibia, even though, as I mentioned, it's not Hellenic, so we'll we'll take a big decadence hit for that. Let's see, with the increased size, we may have, we may have popped out. Oh, wow, we, we didn't pop out, and we got another token. That's, <laughs> it's all, all my luck is being, like, completely weighed back in favor of a positive result based on these progress tokens, that is not a very likely result. In fact, it's, I guess I can do the math, about a 10% chance to get two progress tokens in a row like that. So, so we're doing really well. I hope that you will enjoy this series. I'm gonna wrap this one up here. Because this is the first episode in a whole series, the only time I ask you to do this, but uh, if you wouldn't mind pressing the like button, pushing the thumbs up, just to increase visibility on YouTube, and uh, if you are unfamiliar with my channel, I do respond to, I try to respond to every single comment. So feel free to make a comment and let me know what you think about things there. And uh, that's going to do it for the first episode. So I'll see you back for episode two and we'll continue the Pontus expansion. Hopefully we'll see our expansion to the known world. Until then, thanks for watching and take care.